Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's very nice to be here. Uh, a faraway place, but with lots and lots of old friends and hopefully some new ones, too. Well, I have the honor of getting us started, and I did not pick this topic. Uh, well, I picked this topic before I knew where I was on the program, so there's nothing uh, about this. But it's uh, apropos that we start with a consideration of rhythmic, well, formedness, which in music theory circles is a well-known term. It was stolen from linguistics um, in terms of uh, linguistic well-formedness. And in the linguistic tradition, a well-formed sentence is a, is a sentence that a competent speaker of a language would utter, as well as a competent speaker would understand. So by uh, rhythmic well-formedness, we want to know about what is a uh, well-formed musical rhythm. Or to put it another way, are you a good rhythm or a bad rhythm? Uh, now, this, of course, is the Wizard of Oz uh, binary distinction. <laughs> between Glinda, the good witch of the north, and the nameless wicked witch of the west. I thought, I looked it up and I thought she'd have, there's no name, she's so bad, she doesn't even have a name. So, all right, let us first begin with bad rhythms. Uh, and there are many, uh, which by we mean non-well-formed rhythms. And I will claim that there are several different kinds of bad rhythms. Impossible rhythms. This is a picture uh, of the church in Halberstadt, Germany, in which a performance of John Cage's organ squared ASLSP as slow as possible is currently underway. The performance will last 639 years. The performance began on September 5th, 2001 with an initial rest that lasted until February 3rd, 2003, uh, and we, uh, I will resist the, if you want, you can go to the website, uh, www.aslsp.org slash .de, and you can get a live feed from the current note. Um, all right, so this is impossible because none of us are going to live long enough to hear the whole damn thing. Uh, so uh, that sort of puts a damper on a grasp of its rhythmic structure. Uh, so. I claim that uh, it's impossible in, 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 a, in that sense. Here's sort of uh, the opposite example. Uh, this one uh, is composed by me, uh, which is an example I made for uh, another paper I called the subtle etude number one. Uh, the point here, uh, oh, the tempo marking is, uh, I omitted, it's molto adagio. Uh, so the problem here is the dynamic and durational uh, distinctions are too, so small, you can't tell the difference. Um, another rhythmic failure, because it's impossible for a human being to play these, where uh, the distinctions between the notes are on the order of 40 milliseconds uh, of notes that are about two and a half seconds long a piece. Um, now, both this and the cage may be very interesting act, uh, examples of conceptual art, right? But in terms of an actual experienced rhythm, they're impossible. Here's uh, yet a third and last impossible rhythm is a self-contradictory rhythm. This is uh, from a paper by Julian Hook um, on how to perform impossible rhythms. And this is his diagram of uh, uh, some notation from Brahms' uh, variations on an original theme, opus 21, number one uh, for solo piano. As Julian points out, Brahms' notation, if read literally, requires that a single note be articulated in two different temporal locations, because he mixes up the duplets and triplets. Um, and that's just impossible. You can't play the same note twice. Um, now, my rejoinder to Jay was that uh, we all know that that's not what Brahms literally meant. Uh, and I think he's trying to capture some aspects of expressive nuance, as well as the indicate the line that Brahms desired. But uh, one can uh, notate these impossible rhythms. So there's the impossible. Then there's the improbable. Uh, and these are rhythms and meters that are rare in a particular style or culture. Um, uh, there's 9-8 in Western classical music. And I know David Huron's uh, 
mentioned this before, the binary bias, uh, as have I in other papers. If you go through the redoubtable Barlow and Morgan Stern uh, anthology of uh, uh, classical music in Chippets, uh, only 1.1% of all the examples are in 9-8, whereas almost 55% are in simple duple. 3-4 is not terribly common in rock music, although it is in country, because uh, all country artists can do a waltz, but apparently rockers can't. That might have something to do about rock drummers. Non-isochronous beats in Western music more generally. This has led uh, uh, music theorists in the 19th century when, who were uh, confronted with such imp uh, improbable rhythms to claim that they were simply impossible. So we have Moritz Hauptmann who's claimed that a, f a measure with five or seven beats was simply, even, was simply inconceivable. Although by saying that, he conceived it. Um, right. Then there's some rhythms that are just misunderstood. Here's an example uh, from uh, Henry Stobart and Ian Cross's uh, 2000 uh, article on uh, the music of the Andes uh, the, from for the Potosi region of uh, northern Bolivia. Let's give it a listen. <laughs> We're getting a little distortion there, but um, uh, that's not important. You see here a typical transcription that it was, in fact, the, the first transcription that Henry made of this piece, uh, and it's done with a, an upbeat. Problem is, there are no upbeats in Potosi music, and they don't quite think of it as syncopated in the same way either, and, this, and uh, Stobart and Cross go into the linguistic backgrounds, which under underlie this, this way of hearing it. So in fact, uh, although it's very difficult for us to hear this, except as an anacrustic music with an upbeat and all the long notes on downbeats, uh, the guitar playing and there is uh, some dancing that goes on with it uh, means that uh, it doesn't have an upbeat, at least it, not if you're a northern Bolivian. Last but not least, they're rhythms that I just don't like. Uh, now, I had to cut down on a long list of possible rhythms, and I actually like some of these. Um, I'll only play one, because we want to keep things brisk here, but I, I can play other ones later. Uh, this is uh, Too Much Rubato. Acceleration curves are kind of steep there. <laughs> All right, I I'll skip the other ones. Um, now these may or may not be well formed according, according to certain other criteria, and by the way, I'm not making a distinction that one probably should in terms of performed rhythms, which is the rubato added to the underlying rhythmic structures that are being rubotified. Uh, but um, from other points of view, they're just another durational sequence that has to be understood in a certain way. Um, uh, so uh, these may, may be perfectly well formed by various criterion, but there is a preference uh, condition that kicks in in terms of it being a bad rhythm, and it can bleed over into being a mal, you know, something that would be considered not just one I don't like, but one that's actually malformed. So bad rhythms are impossible. <clears throat> And there are various kinds of Im impossibility. I've uh, mentioned just uh, sort of impossible to perform or possible to perceive, uh, but not necessarily conceive. Uh, obviously, one can conceive rhythms that take 639 years to perform. Um, improbable, where I think a lot of 
thing, uh, time than people are talking about malformed rhythms. They're just rhythms I don't know that rhythms are not familiar in my culture. Right? Rhythms that we misunderstand and rhythms that we just don't like. So let's turn this on our head and look at the good rhythms. All right. Uh, And now, so now I'm going to talk about varieties of well-formedness, uh, which now I have to start making acronyms so that everything will fit on the slide. So I'll talk about WF and uh, rhythmic well-formedness and metric well-formedness, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, a, a well-formed rhythm is characteristic of a particular style, genre, or culture, or cultural practice. And so if you want to write a mazurka, you need a rhythm sort of like this. Right, which is a very good mazurka rhythm, not a rhythm like that. I'm, I'm presuming everyone can read the music notation. Uh, this is a very nice son clave rhythm, but not a very good mazurka rhythm. Uh, so that particular genre, genre context can determine well-formedness. There's notational well-formedness. Those the rhythms that can be rendered in a given notational system. Now, of course, notational systems develop in light of a particular uh, musical practice. And we want to remember a couple of things when we talk about notational well-formedness. One is that notational systems are always incomplete. They were designed with a very functional or practical purpose, for the most part, to provide the musician just enough information so he or she knows how to reproduce the, the musical object. Usually isn't a complete representation of rhythmic structure. In fact, that would be a bad idea in terms of trying to have all the information there. It would be burdensome and, uh, and too much to, for the performer to deal with. Indeed, one important thing we can learn from notational well-formedness is that successful notational systems make distinctions that are relevant to human perception production of rhythms. So for example, uh, one big thing is you ha need some way of making distinctions among basic durational categories, longs, mediums, and shorts with various kinds of orthographies. Uh, notational systems that do this are capturing a basic aspect of how we hear and perceive rhythms and then relationships within those categories can also be nuanced, but as I'll get to in a minute, there's a big aspect of well-formedness is, is respects human categorical perception of duration. Uh, so the notational system can align with it. And of course, notations are tied to the technologies um, in which they, you know, from which they bloom. It can be the technologies of the instruments that are involved, depending on the kinds of uh, rhythmic uh, durations and durational patterns an instrument might be capable of making. Uh, uh, for example, if you look at tablature notation for early keyboards or the lute, it has onset timing but not offset timing because for plucked string instruments you don't need offset timing most of the time, uh, given the decay. Uh, there's the cultural technologies of counting systems. Maria Busaburger has talked in uh, in her dis uh, discussions of the history of rhythmic notation showed how changes in, account in, in numbering systems paralleled or in fact under undergirded changes in the development of early uh, rhythmic notation from the modal to the early manifestations of mensural rhythms because of an, a move away from Roman counting systems to newer ones. So there are technologies of many kinds that can be involved in in the background of the development of things. Now, just as, uh, uh, as notation can shed a window into a well-formed rhythm, it, it also uh, can be a springboard to possibilities that might exceed other kinds of well-formedness. So here's my favorite example, Whipping Boy, uh, Henry Weinberg's String Quartet Number no. 2, uh, something that's just impossible to play uh, I especially like the quarter note equals 85 and 5 sevenths beats per minute. Um, 
And then the, the groupings and things with the hemi, hemi, demi, semi quavers tied over uh, as quintuplets within a septuple. I mean, it, it's just, now, it's just nuts. But it's what's, what the notation is the enabler here for the conception of this. Now, early on, I mean, the, the development of notational frameworks was, was a great springboard to the development of all, all kinds of rhythmic and contrapuntal possibilities, but it does, as they say, cut both ways. All right, I want to race through some other things. There are theoretical kinds of well-formedness um, uh, based on some ac uh, formal system with rules and axioms. So we have everything from uh, taking a set of primitives and adding to their concatenation. Uh, uh, this is uh, hierarchic relationships, uh, limits on durational relationships that to say we're going to make everything out of a, a chronos protos and, and concatenations of a single thing or we'll have two different uh, categories. Uh, and most recently, uh, concerns with symmetries of, of rhythmic and rhythmic patterns and metrical patterns. Uh, although, Gottfried, we have some antecedents, Fetis was talking in the 19th century about essentially about symmetry conditions, though not quite in our terms of maximal evenness, right? Uh, then uh, there's perception and production. These two things are intimately linked in terms of the, the kinds of rhythms we can perceive as well as the kinds of rhythms we can produce. And just two things, uh, rhythms uh, often need to be countable to tell the difference between a quadruplet or a triplet. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a whole study of numerosity and our ability to grasp n uh, numbers and quantities directly and indirectly. Uh, and Bruno Rep has shown that uh, we actually are pretty bad at primes other, higher than three. So we have trouble perceptually and cognitively with fives and sevens. Uh, so Hopman maybe was not quite so crazy. Uh, and then we have to be able to make dis durational categorization and discrimination. So there's a few things there. Um, there's the uh, <coughs> rhythms we can perform. Uh, so they have to be uh, stable uh, at, and reproducible. And what are the kinds of rhythmic relationships we can per perform? There's a tendency when presented with a uh, rhythm that has a lot of different durational categories that we actually, both in production and perception, reduce them down to a smaller number. Desain and Honing did some good work with that, um, uh, as did uh, Paul Frace and uh, Bruno Rep, Peter Keller and I have found some more recently this happening in the context of uh, non-isochronous rhythms and most most interestingly, uh, Bruno, Peter, and I found that uh, when asked to play certain uneven rhythms, uh, we don't have to go to simple basic ratios, but we don't, uh, we, we, we move to certain attractor ratios. We seem to be attracted to interesting um, irrational ratios that makes an uneven rhythm comfortably uneven, not going to anything that would imply an even rhythm or an uneven rhythm. Um, and then here's a few other things in terms of performance. Uh, rhythm that uh, evokes a beat is important uh, so that one can entrain to it. And uh, tandem with that is a rhythm that we can synchronize with. So varieties of well-formedness. Uh, Rhythms that are typical of a style or genre, right? Rhythms that can be notated in a particular notational or representational system. Uh, rhythms that fit my theory or someone else's theory. And then rhythms that are perceivable, performable, and I want to stress the ability to be performed by multiple human agents acting together. Uh, right. So now, with the minute and a half I have left, I will uh, give what they call in psychology an operational definition of rhythmic well formedness. The premise is rhythms are fundamentally a human endeavor that occurs in a thick cultural context, so we need to be looking at those behaviors in those contexts that produce the 
kind of rhythm. So that's the gambit. If that's where we're looking, I will claim that rhythmic well-formedness involves two jointly necessary conditions. Well-formed rhythms are temporal patterns that can be reliably reproduced by human performers. They can't be sort of one-off things, but the reproducibility thing gets to the stability and intentionality of the agent, and that human uh, listeners can tell them apart. Right? Uh, uh, the discrimination can be qualitative rather than quantitative, so long as one can make distinctions along that line in terms of a, a, these are kind of the same patterns of longs and shorts, but they have different motional characteristics. And if one can reliably make that dis qualitative distinction, they can do so. And you ne need not even be able to have this couched in the form of declarative knowledge. One can imagine uh, action sequences that make those kinds of decisions, things that I can dance to more easily or not. Right. If that's rhythmic well-formedness, metrical well-formedness supervenes on rhythmic well-formedness with two additional conditions. Well-formed meters involve well-formed rhythms that can be jointly performed by two or more human agents. So I'm, the Boulez rhythm that I did not play can be played by one human agent, but it's very hard for two human agents to play them together in concert, at least without a click track. Um, right. And uh, well-formed meters give rise to an endogenous set of beat, beat or pulse, but there's some additional conditions that beats and pulses need not be isochronous, though we do need some periodicities for a beat pattern to emerge. And the rhythms uh, that generate them uh, need not be uh, cyclic, uh, need not be, uh, I need to be cyclical in order to establish a metrical period. I believe if these conditions obtain, you will, that that's what's going on in those conditions when we would say that a, a human being is making a well-formed uh, rhythm. And I'll skip some things about rhythm and bad meter, so um, just a few closing slides. Uh, rhythmic well-formedness can be captured then a number of different ways, stylistically in terms of the typicality in a genre, notationally, pro protocols and possibilities for durations, formally uh, as patterns with requisite durational, periodic, and or symmetrical structures, behaviorally as stable perception action sequences, and something I haven't talked about at all, but of course we will talk about in the next coming days, neurobiologically as observable patterns of brain activity. Right. Understanding rhythmic well-formedness then, grounded in this sort of operational definition of human behavior, requires cross-cultural study because just as in linguistics, we need to know the full range of rhythmic possibilities. The, the understanding of a well-formed sentence changed a lot when one looked widely at, at the full range of human linguistic utterances and possible grammars. And it also requires cross-disciplinary study to uncover the biases and blind spots inherent in any single approach. These projects remain unfinished, and so I conclude by saying we still don't know what rhythmic well-formedness is. But if we don't know what rhythmic well-formedness is, there's plenty of work for us to do at this conference. Thank you very much.